Our Bible reading for today comes from the book of Matthew, and it's Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. That's Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. Matthew 15, verses 1 to 20. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, then they are not to honour their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people will honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a pit. Peter said, explain this parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony and slander. These are what defiles a person, but eating without unwashed hands does not defile them. As we already know, Jesus used the parables to teach his followers about God, about God's kingdom and about the people of God's kingdom. God's kingdom can be thought of as God's dynamic, personal rule throughout the universe, a rule that fashions a community of faithful followers to model his mandates for creation. Last week we looked at the way the kingdom of God creates a choice for people to respond to their invitation, a choice that could well be costly. In his book Interpreting the Parables, Craig Blomberg says that those who would truly follow Christ must be prepared to abandon whatever might stand in the way of wholehearted discipleship. In doing so, they acknowledge their utter worthiness to earn God's favour. They commit themselves to a life of stewardship, obeying God's commands, making concern for societies oppressed and afflicted a priority, and avoiding the idolatry which invariably comes with the needless accumulation of possessions. We've seen these themes running through the parables that we've already looked at. Today's parable is an interesting one. It doesn't take the form of a typical parable, but it is classed as such, and the themes contained within it are a common thread through much of Jesus' teaching. Shortly before this passage in Matthew 15, Jesus feeds the 5,000. He walks on water with Peter and then heals a multitude of people who come to see him. In the passage following this one, he delivers the demon-possessed daughter of a Gentile woman, he heals another multitude of sick, and feeds the 4,000. Sandwiched between these two amazing passages about the supernatural works and wonders where Jesus reveals his divine nature and pulls back the curtain on the coming age, the Pharisees pop in with a question about his disciples' table manners. Really important stuff. The Pharisees held to tight traditions, a way of operating under their own interpretation of scripture. They believed it was keeping to these traditions and obeying the letter of the law that kept them pure 
in God's eyes. We see this in stories like Mark 3 verses 1 to 6. At another time Jesus went to the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man, stand up in front of everyone. Then he asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. There's a similar story where Jesus and his disciples pick grain on the Sabbath and the Pharisees are quick to try and catch him out on this as well. In both cases, their traditional interpretation of the law, prohibiting them from doing anything that might count as work or business, had become detrimental to the well-being of the people around them, violating God's commandments to honour him and care for others. It'd be most unfortunate if someone happened to have an accident or fall ill on the Sabbath because under Pharisaic tradition, they would just have to wait until the next day. Heaven forbid someone break tradition. However, here we see that Jesus puts them to the test and says that to put others in danger, to ignore their immediate needs or their genuine needs, or to withhold the ways in which we can honour them and serve them, is a tradition that's contrary to God's desire and a violation of the principles and purposes behind God's commandments. That's what we call legalism. Legalism is in some ways an easy way of living. It typically doesn't require nuance, deep thought, self-reflection, adaptation or transformation. It allows us to rigidly stick to what we believe is the most obvious course of action and dismiss anyone who doesn't comply. It keeps us, often in our mind, above others and is ultimately and often conveniently self-serving. It leads to an idolatry of the tradition that it lives by. Now in the case of good intention and genuine mistake, the Lord in his kindness and by his spirit can most gently rebuke and redirect us when we've misunderstood his word. We've talked before about what it means to grow in spiritual maturity. As a young Christian, as many others do, I would often hold particularly hard lines about how I should live out my faith and how I expected others to. Sometimes it was motivated by a desire to be right, not to be righteous. At a stage where I desired to just meticulously be faithful to God, but I didn't have the life experience to understand the nuance of God's kingdom and operation, my behaviour and my attitude could be a little bit legalistic. Over the years, God has gently steered me towards a more grace-filled understanding of his desires. And that allows me, to the best of my ability, to be obedient to his commands in a way that's motivated by a love for God and of others. This is an expected part of the Christian journey. As we put our faith into practice in the real world, we'll inevitably need to exercise our understanding of biblical obedience in different ways. While we may not actually change our core convictions in any drastic way, though we might, if we're humble and teachable, our understanding and operation in the world will change and adapt in different areas over time as we experience more of God and of the world. We're facing that very tension as a church even now. Imagine someone saying, you can't have your traditional Sunday morning service for at least six months. Had we been more prepared, we would surely have debated how or if this was even possible in great detail. But here we are, by force, our traditional Sunday morning at 11 in the church building with singing and communion and tea is all gone. We've had to adapt and to change. We've had to weigh up the tension between what's non-negotiable and what's flexible. No church of any kind, not negotiable. Church by Zoom and on Facebook? Flexible. We're not fulfilling our tradition, but we are still serving our purpose by worshipping, having fellowship and communion, serving one another and studying the word of God. It's definitely not how we've traditionally done it, and it's perhaps not how we'd prefer to be doing it, but under the circumstances of the world as it is, we're finding our way. <laughs> 
As the leadership meet and discuss our various options and the way forward, we weigh up which course of action will be most honouring to God and the best way to serve his people and be a good witness to the community. What's interesting in this passage here is that Jesus doesn't seem to see the Pharisees as being on this kind of journey. They're not citizens of the kingdom who are with humility trying to serve God and others to the best of their ability. It seems that their personal piety, the desire to be right, the desire to be kingdom gatekeepers, has superseded any desire to truly know God and delight in him by caring for his people. While their activity looks righteous, it may not be true that they are citizens of the kingdom of God. Jesus goes so far as to say, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they're the blind leading the blind. What parable does this remind us of? The one with the weeds. This is the one that Jim took us through. If you remember, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven's like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. Jesus is fairly directly implying that the legalistic Pharisees may not in fact be citizens of the kingdom. The truth is the weeds and the wheat will coexist in the world at times being difficult to tell apart. While their behaviour on the outside makes them look like good candidates and good citizens of the kingdom, Jesus, being fully divine, can see beyond the appearance and into the heart. Their actions revealed a heart that is not marked by the justice, mercy or humility that God requires. Jesus goes on to say, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony and slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile them. The word defile means to damage the purity or appearance of someone. Hopefully you're not eating your breakfast as Jesus gives us a somewhat graphic image about how food passes through the body. We'll not get too much into that one. But what's the deal with the hand washing? It seems like common sense. Is Jesus saying that good hygiene doesn't matter? This seems like a dangerous passage to pull up when every day the government is warning us about the importance of washing our hands and using sanitizer to protect ourselves from contracting the dreaded coronavirus. Well, in Jesus' context, there were no knives and forks. So when it came to eating, it was necessary that the hands, which would scoop food from communal dishes, would be absolutely clean. And it was a mark of respect to the hosts and to the guests that it would be done in company. Prior to performing any religious act of worship or service, hands would be ceremonially washed. This was transformed by the Pharisees of the New Testament age into ritual observance and special rules were laid down at the time as a manner of its performance. It seemed that this tradition had become obsessively important and hygiene aside, they judged the disciples as being disrespectful or less unworthy because they didn't participate in this ceremonial act. As Jesus broke the bread and fed the 5,000, or reclined with his disciples at the houses of Gentiles and tax collectors, the Pharisees looking on may have been aghast that a rabbi and his followers weren't observing their tradition, revealing that this tradition was more important to them than the fellowship being shared or the ministry that Jesus was bringing. Jesus doesn't hold back in telling him what he thinks of their tradition and the way their legalism has compromised their ability to be pure in the eyes of God because it reveals something much more concerning. We know from passages in the Old Testament like 1 Samuel 16 and some of the Psalms that God is interested in the state of our hearts more than the outward appearance. 
He's concerned with the way in which our words and actions reveal what's on the inside. Even actions that seem good, religious, biblical or honouring on the outside can be motivated by a defiled heart. Like the Pharisees, they may seem to keep the commands of God with strict obedience down to the letter, but may do so without genuine love for the Lord and his people. Perhaps a husband comes home with flowers and jewellery for his wife. It could be because he's loving and devoted and simply wants to make her feel special. Or it could reveal a deceitful heart because he feels guilty about something he's been keeping hidden from her. When out for dinner, a colleague could offer to pay for everyone's meal. This may be an act of pure generosity, revealing a selfless heart. Or it may reveal a heart whose deep-rooted desire to be liked attempts to secure people's affection with generosity. When we're struggling, we may have a friend who consistently shows up to take care of us, to help us manage things and give us advice. This could be from a place of genuine love and servitude, a servant heart. Or it could reveal a heart that's driven by an egotistical need to rescue others in order to feel important. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's more concerned about our internal motivations and the alignment of our priorities with his. This seems like something of a worldly problem. People out there reveal hearts that are motivated by greed or power or control. But the scariest thing about this passage is that Jesus is talking to religious people who are doing religious things. People, perhaps, like you and I, the church. Few people group have more traditions than the church. Some are not biblical, they're just traditions particular to our own congregation. Who sits in which seat, the way we celebrate Christmas, or the format of the Sunday service. Some traditions are particular to our doctrine and our denomination, like the way we take communion, the way we baptise people, or the liturgy we use. They're an expression of our understanding of biblical commands and usually a genuine attempt to be obedient to God's purposes and principles. However, as history has shown, it's incredibly easy for tradition to become dogmatic doctrine at the expense of the original intention. As the world changes, so at times our traditions need to change. Not our commitment to obedience, or our desire to achieve God's purposes, but the way in which we operate to serve those purposes. Sadly, these are things that can deeply divide a church and moreover, can harden the hearts of godly individuals. The Pharisees, it seems, devoted their life to the study of scripture and the keeping of the laws. And most likely Jesus knew that even after his death and resurrection, the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the release of the kingdom way of living, the Pharisees would hold rigidly to keeping the laws at the expense of their new life in Christ. We see some of this tension play out in the letters of the New Testament. As the church begins to grow, churches wrestled with how to live out this new citizenship, finding the balance between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. As an example, the tradition of dressing in their finest clothes became a hindrance, something that excluded others from feeling welcome in the fellowship. And Paul has to address the tension between traditional ways of marking respect and the new mandate to welcome the outsider into their midst. This is a tension that will never outrun. The world changes at a rapid pace and the traditions that served biblical purposes today may no longer be fit for purpose tomorrow. We understand that Jesus is challenging the Pharisees to look beyond tradition and align themselves with the heart of God. Their traditions come from their interpretation of the law. When we look back at the Old Testament scripture like Exodus or Leviticus or Deuteronomy, it's easy to understand why following the rules was such a tricky thing. There are loads of them. In fact, there are 613 laws in the Torah alone. And it seems like learning how to keep them all was a full-time job. 
When your very way of life is centred around learning and keeping the law, it's easy to see how one could slide into legalistic tradition. To the Pharisees, it may have looked like Jesus was just throwing the rules out the window and doing whatever he liked. But we know that's not the case. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. This is Jesus' challenge to the Pharisees. Their tradition has completely overlooked God's purpose. So how do we stop ourselves from becoming like the Pharisees and allowing our traditions to be protected over the purposes of God? Well, the first thing we can do is separate commands from traditions. When I was at Bible college, I was in a place where I was slightly disillusioned with church. Everything seemed like dead ritual, doing things for the sake of them without asking why. That wasn't the church's case, of course, but it was certainly how I felt. I couldn't see the point in doing half of what we did, and I got frustrated with what seemed like ridiculous denominational differences. Surprisingly, one of the things that actually helped me was my church history class. Over several weeks, we looked at how church traditions had changed over the years, where and why denominations had split over doctrinal differences. We looked at how each sacrament like communion or baptism took different forms because of the way people interpreted scripture in their context. It helped me to separate what was just traditional preference and what was something done to uphold a particular understanding of God's word. This actually made certain things more meaningful. It then helped me to examine my own personal practices. What was I doing for tradition's sake? And where was I failing to fulfill God's actual purposes and plans? I used to think that you had to do devotions first thing in the morning before breakfast. I've heard it said, no Bible, no breakfast. And if you know me, you know mornings are just not my best time of day. I would do it begrudgingly and I would skip through it quickly so that I could just get to breakfast. <laughs> was it actually serving its purpose in my life? No. Was it honouring to God? Not really. But my heart's desire was to be closer to God and spend meaningful time with him. So I had to change my tradition in order to serve God's purposes. So now I have a short prayer time in the morning with my cup of tea so that God is still the focus to start my day. But I do my devotional time around 2pm because that's when I'm most engaged and able to process things in my heart and in my mind. It's a much more meaningful time that serves its purpose in bringing me closer to God. Over the years, I've developed a more conscious routine for taking Sabbath, making sure the house is clean, the washing is done, the fridge is full, so that my Sabbath is actually a day of rest and restoration. It's serving the purposes of God. That's my tradition. I try and avoid doing any kind of housework, anything menial on the day. But if my friend, a young mum with three children, calls on my Sabbath and says she's struggling, that her husband's away and the kids are out of control and she needs help getting the house in order, what would I do? My tradition is to avoid any kind of housework or domestic labour, but God's command is to love him and to love his people. So in that moment, which would matter more? And what would my actions say about what's in my heart? Which course of action would most align my heart with the Lord's commands? I need to find the commands that are relevant to the situation, compare them with my tradition, and see if the way I'm actually working is in line with what God is asking me. It's easy to absorb Christian phrases or adaptations of the Bible verses into our lives in a way that isn't actually biblical, helpful, necessary, or meaningful. A gentle deconstruction of our tradition can help us assess which things are necessary, which are helpful, and which are preferential. It's not a bad thing to question why we do what we do. Sometimes it leads to a change of course, and sometimes it simply leads to a more meaningful understanding of our actions. The true test of our heart 
is whether or not we're really willing to let go of that which is not fit for God's true purpose. The next thing we can do is look for the purpose behind God's commands. As I said before, there are a lot of rules in the Bible that led the Pharisees' traditions. Reading them without context can make God look like he's micromanaging everything. But the more we understand of God's nature and the way that we should operate under his reign and rule, the more we see the purpose in those rules. God gave Israel rules to teach them from scratch what kingdom living should look like, giving them guidelines that would help them understand what it looks like to live out God's mandate for creation and keep themselves distinct from the rest of the world. Even though we might see some of the rules as strict or strange, the common threads run through each of them. Trust in God as the only God, trust in his abundant provision, respect for the lives of others, cultivation and stewardship of the earth, caring for the stranger, the orphan and the widow. As Israel learned to live out these commandments, it should have transformed their hearts in such a way that keeping them was no longer a legal necessity, but just an intuitive way of living. Think of how we teach young children. We can have very explicit and particular rules, the purpose of which is to teach them the principles they need for later life. We teach them that they must wait their turn so that they learn to respect the place of others and not be self-serving. We have rules about what snacks they can eat and when. It's not about the snacks themselves, but teaching them how to be mindful of their needs and take care of their bodies. We have rules about naps and bedtimes because they don't yet have the maturity to self-regulate and learn the importance of rest. To a child, the rules seem strict and arbitrary. Why can't we stay up all night and eat all the sweets we like? Typically, once we're older and we have the means and the freedom to do all the things we swore we'd do without parental supervision, we learn by experience why some of those rules really did serve a good purpose, and we follow them naturally as a way of life because we see the benefits. This is part of the tension between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. As we look to God's commands, we need to understand what he intends to teach us through them and why it's important for citizens of the kingdom of heaven to live in such a way. Once we grasp this and absorb their meaning, it can become a much more intuitive way of living. While it still requires discipline and obedience, there is so much more freedom and joy to be found in the unforced rhythms of grace that naturally bring us closer to our Creator. So once we've separated tradition from command and looked for the purpose behind this kingdom living, the next step is learning how to live it. We need to ask God to search our hearts and align them with his and to lead us in the way everlasting. In all of this, we must remember that God did not create us to follow rules. That's not our purpose. We need his commands, his word, his guidance, because our natural tendency is to fall into sin. But we were created to have a life of freedom, purpose, worship, relationship and joy, a natural reflection of the image of God here on earth. That life is more available and more abundant when our hearts are in alignment with his. We can keep the Lord's commands as a legal safeguard and live quite a miserable life. Or we can walk closely and intimately with God, allowing his spirit within us to mould us and shape us more and more into his likeness so that our natural tendency is towards holiness. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The words you speak, the actions you take, the habits you form, all flow from the wellspring of your heart. Of course, the world will affect us. The circumstances of the day will shape our responses in the moment. We won't get it all right all of the time. But imagine the joy of a life where love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control are most often and most naturally the overflow of our hearts. Against these things, there is no law, but there are certainly traditions 
that will curb them.